Good morning. I'm Heather Schneider, your service leader. We are joined by Jeremy Johnsick on AV. Today, Alex Malays is here to share the origin of the Save the Michaels organization, as well as a bit of her own story and the idea that changing the way people look at and talk about addiction has potential to change outcomes. Welcome, Alex, and thanks for coming to UUEA. And welcome, friends, members, and visitors to UU of East Aurora. We are a community in which all people are welcomed, regardless of belief systems, ethnicities, race, gender, sexual orientation, or economic standing. You are in a safe space. Before we begin, our membership coordinator, Tara Strade, has some announcements. So next week on the 24th, our speaker is um, Tina Simpson and building meaningful relationships and in community with each other so that everyone feels welcome. That's why I was confused. I was like, that is not the right date. Okay, so we are obviously still holding Sunday services this summer, uh, which I think is wonderful. So we have some kind of con continuity, but we are not going to be continuing to do the full coffee hour. Um, it is absolutely gorgeous outside and we're extremely close to Knox. Um, so the suggestion, which I love, is to uh, meet in the parking lot here at 915 and head to Knox um, for an hour if you're interested in socializing, kind of getting some fresh air, interacting, exercise. It'll be really great. Um, so if you're interested, go ahead. Oh yeah, not today. No, no, no. Today I had my spin class, We're not, we didn't walk today. We will start next week. If you're interested, you can see Heather. Um, upcoming, so I mentioned previously a class that I was going to hold with Mary that didn't happen when I said it was going to happen because life happens. Um, so we are going to be doing this Othering versus Welcoming workshop on August 14th. Um, so it will be myself and Mary as facilitators. Um, I mentioned this like weeks ago, but it's essentially just talking about um, ensuring that when people are coming into new spaces, how can we make people of all age groups feel welcome and what kinds of things can we try to avoid to ensure that they feel the most comfortable in those spaces and they want to return. Um, they want to form a relationship with you. They don't feel standoffish. Um, and so I'll be coming from more of like a 25 year old millennial perspective and then Mary will be jumping in so we can kind of address all questions that are um, coming forth. So if you're interested, just see me after service and let me know. Um, I can give you more information, but uh, we will be doing that my, I think we're doing it following the service, um, but I have to clarify with Mary first. So since we're gonna be walking in Knox Farm, I don't think we're gonna be doing a class beforehand. Um, very exciting, the widening the circle weekend is August 20th and 21st, yay! No one else clap, okay, that's fine. Um, this, it's exciting, like you gotta be excited, yeah. Um, so this is an exploration for families trying to build a, a multicultural moral foundation. Um, the Jubilee Circle is for children starting grades three through seven. So teacher me is like, woo, that's great. Um, it promotes inclusion through words, action, and understanding of historical and contemporary inequities and racism. Emphasis is on experiential learning. So through doing, um, through art, drama, games, and group circle processes, sounds super engaging, really fun. Um, so, and then immersive journey is going to be going on simultaneously. That's for parents. Um, seeking to build a family culture that includes the values of equity, compassion, interdependence, and the inherent worth and dignity of all people. So it includes the Thousand Cut Journey, which is a virtual reality program that allows individuals to experience several events in the life of a young black male. So you can put on the virtual reality set and have that experience yourself so that you get the same feelings and sensations as if you were that person, um, which is also very cool, so yay technology. And then that is all I have right now. So if you have any questions, thanks for bearing with me while I found the email. Uh, enjoy service. Are there any other announcements? I begin this service by acknowledging that our nation was largely built on the ancestral land of native nations and the labor of enslaved peoples. May we persevere to achieve a clear understanding of our shared past and utilize these lessons learned for good and for progress. And now our prelude video. 
We shall be known by the company we keep, by the ones who circle round to tend these fires. We shall be known by the ones who sow and reap the seeds of change alive from deep within the earth. It is time now. shall be known by the company we keep, by the ones who circle round to tend these fires. We shall be known by the ones who sow and reap the seeds of change alive from deep within the earth. saying the chalice lighting words printed on the order of service. We gather this hour as people of faith with joys and sorrows, gifts and needs. We light this beacon of hope, sign of our quest for truth and meaning and celebration of the life we share together. So our opening words by Ian Riddell, come one, come all. Come one, come all. Come with your missing pieces and your extra screws. Come with your hard edges and your soft spots. Come with your bowed heads and upright spines. Come all you flamboyant and drab, verbose and quiet, fidgeting and lethargic. All you with large vision and tender hearts. All you with small courage and tender fears. Bring your lisp and your stutter and your song. Bring your gravel and your drawl and your lilt. Bring your anger and your joy and your righteous indignation. Misfits and conformists and everyone in between. Come into this space and be welcome. Bring who you are, bring where you've traveled, bring what you long for and let us be together. We are reminded that UUEA cannot do anything without members and friends showing up and supporting each other. Sincere thanks to those who participate in events, volunteer their time, share their talents, or who can be generous. If you are inclined to give after the service, there is a plate in the bookshelf, or you may do so online at uuea.org. 
And now our offertory video with All Souls Virtual Choir Spirit of Life. Today's reading is Gentleness by Heather Ryan Starr. May I move gently through this cloudy, murky, gray day. May I remember that this is just one day and that showing up is at least half of what is asked of me. May I set aside my underlying anxiety that I will not get to everything and put my trust and faith onto the riverbank of human community. Alex Malays joined the Save the Michaels team in September of 2021. Alex serves as a recovery coach and as program support for many aspects of the organization. Alex has chosen to dedicate herself to the helping professions after navigating her own unhealthy relationship with substances and her journey into recovery. In May of 2022, Alex celebrated 10 years of continuous sobriety after nearly 15 years of battling her own addiction to drugs and alcohol. She is passionate about holding the light for others as they find their way. Alex is an active member of the Buffalo Theater community and has been featured at the Kavanoke Theater and at Irish Classical. Alex has also been a spokesperson for West Her for nearly five years. Oh, I'm just going to peek at the time. I have my phone up here just for time purposes. Good morning. Good morning. Oh, thank you for having me. This is my first UU service, and I'm just, I, I'm so full right now. I feel so inspired. So what, what a privilege and an honor it is to be here. Um, again, my name is Alex Malays. Uh, I work at Save the Michaels of the World in Buffalo, New York. Uh, there's also a location in Lockport, New York, and we are cutting the ribbon for a location in Newfane, New York in just a few weeks. 
Uh, I have no idea what's gonna come out of my mouth. I have a couple of bullet points. <laughs> uh, I can get tangential and a little chatty, so I'm gonna try to keep it to the bullet points, but I really am asking my own higher power to speak through me uh, and give whoever needs a message today, whether it's in this room or on Zoom, uh, what they need, right? And we plant seeds and we don't get to really determine when and if those seeds get cultivated, uh, but this is what I'm here. I'm just here to share the message of Save the Michaels and then my own message and hopefully somebody can walk away with something that they need today. Uh, I did bring some materials that are in the other room. Uh, so uh, some information, sometimes the verbal isn't enough and you need stuff in black and white. So there are a few different kinds of pamphlets in the other room, uh, an information sheet. Please feel free to take them. And, and if you don't need them for yourself, to, to leave them where you think they might be useful and or give them to somebody who, who might need them. There's also those little rubber bracelets that have our website and a phone number on them in there as well. So my intention, for the next 25 minutes or so, is to tell you the origin story of Save the Michaels of the World, uh, talk a little bit about our services that we offer today, uh, maybe touch a little bit on my own journey, and then uh, kind of a call to action or just uh, creating some awareness around where we're at in the world of addiction and substance use disorder uh, currently. Uh, so, Save the Michaels origin story um, started with a young man named Michael David Israel. Uh, at a very young age, he was diagnosed with Crohn's disease, which is a chronic, digestive, painful belly issue. Uh, his parents, Avi and Julie Israel, who are the founders of Save the Michaels of the World, uh, hopped right on that, and they wanted to get Michael help. Uh, so the doctors informed them that it is a chronic disease and there really isn't a cure for it. Um, so, you know, speaking of uh, changing nutrition and supplements and also prescribing opioid medication for pain. Uh, so, Julie and Avi did what the doctor ordered, right? They, you know, helped him with his nourishment and his overall health and his supplements, and then they, you know, administered these painkillers for, for Michael. Um, over time, Michael grew to like the effects of the painkillers and the opioids and began to misuse them. Uh, he began to what they call doctor shop, uh, which is when you go to different doctors and ask for the same medication. And so he had it in plethora, uh, and he was taking it as not as prescribed anymore. Um, he realized that he had a problem, and he went to his parents and said, I have a problem. And Julie and Avi didn't know anything about addiction or what was happening with young Michael, who must have been late teens at this time. And so they had no idea what to do um, for help. Uh, this is about 11 or so years ago. Uh, so the internet was just less helpful, uh, you know, he, he, was in, uh, he was an electrician, she was in banking. They, they just, addiction had come into their life and they were really uncertain about what to do about it. So what they found is that they didn't really know what the resources were. Uh, when they found resources, they didn't find the resources to be helpful. Um, they went back to his pediatrician or wh whomever had prescribed the pills and said he has a problem and they kind of pushed him off and said, well, this is what we, this is what we do for this disease, so just trust us. Um, so the long and the short of it, it, is, it was years and years of battle, of searching for help for Michael. This is back in a time 
when you had to uh, fail out of outpatient treatment, whereas where you're not in a facility, you just go to your therapist and go to groups and, and try to abstain on your own, you had to fail out of a program like that in order to be admitted into an inpatient program. So they were finding like barriers with, with um, getting him checked in somewhere where he could get help. They were finding barriers with their insurance saying, you know, we don't treat people with addiction. We don't treat people with substance use disorder or mental health disorders, or it's very limited. Um, so unfortunately, in 2011, uh, this disease got the best of Michael. And um, after, you know, running into all of these barriers and what felt like rejection, um, he sadly took his own life at 20 years old. Uh, he was in his family's home. Avi and Julie rushed into the room and, you know, were with him in his last moments. And it didn't take long for the two of them to activate. I'm getting emotional just thinking about it. They started Save the Michaels at their kitchen table um, to make sure that this didn't happen to anyone else. Um, and they really started as activists and advocates and educators. Uh, they didn't understand how this could happen to a young man and how there, were, there wasn't the help that they needed and that when they got to a person who might be able to help, that person was resistant and reluctant. Um, and so, they have been um, at the front lines of a lot of the changes that have happened politically and within policy. Uh, Avi is constantly in Albany fighting the good fight, trying to make politicians and people who create these policies see that it's, these are people that we're dealing with here. And this is a chronic disease of the mind um, and that it needs to be treated as such. So remember when I told you about the doctor shopping, Avi and Julie had a huge role in creating the iStop program, which is, means your, your prescriptions are no longer handwritten. You can't get prescriptions from different people. There's a system now put in place where if a narcotic is prescribed to you, we know how much, when, from whom, how often you're getting it. That's why narcotics now are very regulated. Um, and you can't get your refill before. Um, so Avi and Julie had a lot to do with that. So um, I've only been with Save the Michaels, not quite even a year, and September will be a year anniversary for me. But I can tell you that when I walked in there for my interview, I knew that that's where I needed to be. Uh, it is a space that is filled with love, and they treat every person who walks in that door as though they are Michael. Uh, we believe in, in human contact, right? No, we're not sending you to a push button, get to this person to get to that person. There's no automated holds. Uh, there's a receptionist that answers the phone, unless she's on a lunch. Like there might be a 30 minute window where she can't. Um, but you're always going to be handed off to a human being. Um, so over the last decade, Save the Michaels continues that good fight in Albany and Washington DC. But we also are very active in different ways now. And so we, uh, it's a, it's a beautiful thing, and, and we're growing and changing all the time. So one of the things that we do currently and actively is if somebody needs help, and there's that tiny window where somebody goes, oh, I'm really struggling, and today's the day that I want to get help, because addiction and substance use disorder is a disease of the mind, and it takes away a lot of motivation, and it, take, it is delusional, right? It makes you believe things that aren't true. And so when there is that window and somebody needs help, all they have to do is call Save the Michaels. We do a brief intake, which is like demographic information. We find out a little bit about your mental health and your physical health. And we send referrals all over the state of New York. 
to treatment programs. And those treatment programs accept or reject based on whatever your needs are. Uh, and we can get people placed in a treatment program between 24 and 72 hours. If transportation is an obstacle for that person, for whatever reason, maybe the family's given up and they don't want to have anything to do with that person, or they're homeless and they don't have transportation, we have a fleet of vehicles and a fleet of drivers, and we will take you there, whether it's all the way in New York City, Pennsylvania, or just down the road at Stutzman on, on Forest Avenue. We'll take you there. And if you complete the program, we'll come and pick you back up. So it's efficient and fast, and you have a team of people working for you. Um, and so it's quite remarkable what we can do, because remember, Avi and Julie were running into obstacles about like, where do we take him? What do we do? And for now, it's just a simple one phone call can change that person's life. A couple of other avenues that we do is we have insurance support. There's an organization in the state of New York called CHAMP, which uh, implements some parity laws so that people who are struggling with substance use and addiction and mental health issues are treated the same way as somebody with cancer or diabetes or any other chronic condition. You don't take somebody with diabetes and say, oh, in 28 days you'll be fine. <laughs> you know, it's a lifelong condition and they need medication and they need checkups and they need treatment. And what's happened in the world of substance use and mental health is 28 day program, you should be good to go. No, it's a, it's a lifelong chronic disease and it needs ongoing care. And so this organization specifically in regards to insurance barriers is here to fight for people's rights to have ongoing health care for their substance use disorder and mental health concerns. So that's amazing. We have a person on staff that is affiliated with that organization and can help immediately. If somebody's uninsured, we can help them get insured, right? Just pointing them in the right directions. We're resource brokers, right? We, we know the resources and we're getting you to those resources. And then the, the last avenue that we um, take care of is what we do is called recovery coaching, right? We're not therapists, we're not counselors, we're coaches. I am a recovery coach certified by the state of New York. There's a certification for that. Uh, I'd say that 98 to 99% of the people who work at Save the Michaels have their own experiences with substance use disorder. Uh, so a coach, if you think about it, is what? Somebody that motivates and inspires and encourages and pushes a little bit. Um, and so that's what I get to do all day long, is I get to deal with people who are struggling and say, look at, I got through to the other side. And so let me help, let me hold that light for you, right? I know the way and I'm, I'm gonna hold the light for you while you're figuring it out. Um, and it's really, really cool to kind of walk with someone. So we believe in person-centered care, right? So that's a person, it's not a disease, it's a person sitting in front of us, us that is struggling, and strength-based care, right? So we highlight the good that you bring to the table, that like organic, innate good that every human brings to the table. And what happens in addiction and substance use disorder is worth is depleted, value is depleted, esteem is depleted. Like I said, there's this kind of a state of delusion that we live in. And what's cool about somebody who has struggled before, sitting across from somebody who's currently struggling, is that I can see them in a way that maybe their family can't, that maybe their friends can't. Um, I understand them and have like the deepest empathy for where they're at right now in this moment. Um, so what we do is create a plan together, right? And talk about like, what, what, what are you fired up about? What did you put down in life and picked up drugs and alcohol for that you wanna pick up again? What's something new that you never tried that you wanna do? Like getting them pumped up and fired up for life again. 
And sometimes these people are so depleted, they just don't even know, right? They forgot. <laughs> but I believe that that exists innately in every human being. And so it's my job to kind of dig around in there and say, hey, you know, did you play an instrument that you forgot about? Or you, you, you know, you, you, now this delusional chatter is telling you you're not good enough? No, you are. I'm here to tell you you are. And to stand before someone as an example of somebody in recovery, they look at you different, right? They look at you with like a little hope and say, wow, I can't believe that she struggled with substance use disorder and like now she's doing this, right? I live a very big life now that I'm in recovery and I wanna stand before people and offer that light. Um, one of my favorite avenues of services that we provide is family recovery coaching because oftentimes the families don't understand the disease of addiction and they're angry and they're hurt and they're disappointed that their loved one is not living the life that they had expected of them. Um, so for me to spend time with families, moms, loved ones, spouses, siblings, and teach them about this disease and normalize their loved one's behavior as a symptom of the disease to offer a different kind of perspective, right? To shine a light in different corners, to talk about effective helping and ineffective helping. Because we're all wanting to help our loved one, but sometimes we're doing things that might not be helpful at all, right? Supplying a loved one who is struggling with cash, that's not effective. That's not effective helping. That person is going to take it and go, right? This is an, an obsession of the mind, right? So one of the gifts that I get to do is work with families. Um, so I encourage you all, that's pretty, you know, we also do groups, uh, support groups for people who are uh, family members, grandparents, uh, people who have lost someone to substance use disorder, uh, we, we have a women's group, we have a men's group, Lockport has a ton of groups, uh, because we believe in fellowship as well. We believe that when you're with like-minded people, you can heal and grow together um, and not feel so isolated. Addiction and substance use disorder is an isolating disease, um, and so we need to be around our people uh, to grow and heal. Um, so... Really, that sums up the services that we offer at Save the Michaels. So that's placement and treatment, transportation to get there, coaching for individuals who are struggling either before. I work with many people who are in active use. And then I work with people who have a year sober and just want to stay on the right track, right? Families who are struggling to understand. They're looking for a different way to communicate with their loved one. Sometimes I find that um, if I can get the family member to shift the dance a little bit, that the loved one meets them, right? The one who is struggling meets them and they're like, why is my mom acting so different right now? Why does it seem like she cares and is compassionate towards me? Oh, we're starting to communicate differently. And next thing you know, they're seeking help. They're calling Save the Michaels for a coach. They're calling Save the Michaels for treatment. So sometimes it's the family member that comes first before the loved one asking for help. Um, so yeah, that is the, the, the bandwidth of our services. I, like I said, I've left information in um, the reception area. There's different flyers for coaching, for families, for individuals, um, for the tr placement and treatment. And then there's a couple of these that list all of our services. And again, I encourage you to check us out. We just got a beautiful new website. Um, you'll see the scanny thing here, a QR code, I don't know, I'm not very technologically savvy. I look to the guy in the, <laughs> with the earphones on, what is that, what is that called? Um, so, a little bit of my own story. Uh, as Heather said, I struggled for about 15 to 20 years. Um, you know, when I was in college, I was a bartender, like how cool. You know, very popular, very... Uh, a lot of power back there, it was pretty back there, people wanted, you know, my attention back there. And I guess I thought like, oh, I'll grow out of this, right? 
Um, but what I found, you know, and this is after 10 years of recovery, is that uh, alcoholism and probably other substance use disorders is a progressive disease, right? So what was fun in my 20s became really ugly in my 30s. Um, and I was waking up in places that I didn't recognize with bruises I couldn't account for and people I didn't know and, you know, bodily fluids that one should not wake up in at the age of 37 years old. I was living in New York City at the time. I was putting myself in really dangerous situations, riding the subways and a complete blackout with, you know, as a bartender, lots of money in my pocket. Like, that's really <laughs> not smart. Um, and it didn't take a big consequence for me, right? I didn't have to wrap my car around a telephone pole or destroy a relationship or a family. I knew that I had a spiritual sickness. I couldn't even look at myself in the mirror anymore, um, which told me that there was a version of me that I wanted to become and that this disorder was not allowing me to get there. It was, it was blocking me. Um, so when I was 37 years old, I was seeking, I was in active therapy uh, and that person told me I couldn't uh, start addressing like the childhood stuff, like all the things that I wanted to talk about, the rejection and the childhood traumas that I experienced until I stopped drinking. And I was like, oh, I don't, you know, that's not my problem. It's all these other things. It's, you know, that my mom abandoned me when I was five and this and that and the next thing. And she said, no, well, what if you stopped drinking and, and we'll, we can see. And so I accepted her challenge. Um, and I am actively engaged in a program uh, and have been for 10 years. And I'll tell you, my life has changed tremendously uh, and has brought me to the service of this field of substance use disorder. I have a degree in the, I have two degrees in theater. Um, that is my first career, and for me to end up in the field, the helping professions, is actually an additional career and a late life career pivot, because I'm 47 years old now, and so just two years ago was I back in college and writing papers and, you know, applying for these certifications. Um, but I do believe that it's a calling and that I stand now on the bedrock of that destruction, right? Like those missteps and that, those um, setbacks are all what I stand upon now. Right, so my, my destruction and demise in my 30s is now what gives me strength and makes me tall today and makes me a helper, right, for others because I wouldn't be able to help people the way that I'm helping people now without that experience. And so I'm what they call in the world a grateful alcoholic, if that makes any sense. <laughs> because I'm able to have a connection with whatever looks out for me now and I'm able to use my story to help and inspire others. So if I could leave you with anything today, um, it's really to stay awake and alert around addiction and substance use disorder. Um, it's, it doesn't just happen to those people, right? It happens to this person. It happens to teachers and doctors and lawyers and politicians. And it's not just a certain demographic or color of skin. And it's not just a certain socioeconomic person that gets addiction. It's for anyone. It does not discriminate. And for years and decades and centuries, we've been stigmatizing people with addiction as lepers, right? It's those people. What's wrong with you? Why can't you stop doing that? Why do you keep doing this to yourself? Why don't you just stop? It is a, an obsessive disease of the mind. And they can't stop. They can't stop. I couldn't stop. And so it is imperative that we, and like what a great space and what a great community for me to share this message, that we embrace these people with compassion 
and empathy. And we've had a big movement in the world of addiction and substance use disorder to shift the language. Like I mentioned, um, you know, person-centered language, strength-based language. So we don't necess necessarily say, you're an addict anymore. That's very stigmatizing. You're a junkie, this or that or the next thing. It's you're a person first. You're a person who struggles with substance use disorder. You're a person who struggles with alcohol. You're a person who has a condition a chronic condition that needs ongoing care. Um, so we're really working on shifting the language in our field and making it a softer language, making it a compassionate, empathetic language uh, so that we can meet people where they're at and they feel loved, right, and seen. And we think that that's gonna change the way that people heal from this disease. And if they're put in a corner and just told like, fix yourself and leave us alone, like that's not helpful. That's ineffective helping, like I was talking about earlier. So get educated, right? Know that probably every single one of you has someone in the, your life that is afflicted with this condition, right? It happens to everyone, not everyone, but a lot of people. <laughs> um, and so, just staying aware and alert and educated. The peer movement that I'm a part of um, is shown to be like evidence-based, right? That people are responding really well to somebody else who has been there before. And so a lot of organizations are embracing peers along with counselors and therapists and trained clinicians and professionals. They're also bringing peers into the room because that person feels safe and seen and not ashamed, right? So uh, like I said, if I could leave you with anything, it would be to stay awake and alert. Um, I think that we're gonna have an opportunity for questions in a moment. We'll give people time to ruminate on if there's anything that comes up for you. Uh, sometimes people get a little nervous to ask a question. And I'm gonna stick around for a little bit after. So if there's anything you wanna say to me personally, I do have a few business cards and again, um, all of the materials. But I, I really am just so grateful. I feel blessed to be here. Um, like I said, the beginning portion of the service was super inspiring and I felt like I was in a space of of love and inclusivity, and I just, that really um, sings to me. So thank you so much for having me, and enjoy the rest of your day. And I hand it back to whoever takes it back. Oh. <clears throat> Please join me for the extinguishing of the chalice. We extinguish this flame, but not the light of truth, the warmth of community, or the fire of commitment. These we carry in our hearts until we are together again. And our closing words will be given uh, today by Alex. Um, and then, as she said, she, she's going to stick around for um, a question and answer period after our postlude video. Okay. So my closing words are just two sentences. Addiction is complicated. Getting help doesn't have to be. So thanks. Sometimes I'm right and I can be wrong. My own beliefs are in my songs. Butcher the baker, the drummer, and then makes no difference what group I'm in. Sometimes I'm right and I can be wrong My own beliefs are in my song The butcher, the banker, the drummer and then It makes no difference what group I'm in Cause I am everyday people
So for our question and answer period, if you don't mind coming up to the microphone so people on Zoom can hear you, um, or if there are any questions on Zoom, I think Jeremy could share them for us. Questions, comments? Uh, so she asked if there were programs for recovery that uh, are not r religiously inspired. Um, I'm not entirely sure about specific treatment facilities, but there is what we embrace now, um, multiple pathways to recovery. Um, the 12 steps were originated in the 1930s by two men and it did come from biblical studies. Uh, however, that doesn't work for everyone, right? That doesn't work for everyone. Uh, and so nowadays, there is multiple pathways to recovery. Now, I, do I believe that fellowship is an important part of the equation? Yes. And so that means that there are people out there doing SMART recovery, which is a science-based recovery program. And it's more about behaviors and um, changing the way that you do things and changing the way that you think. So it's a much more mind behavior-based program. Um, and there's a Buddhist-based programs. So there's lots of different ways to find recovery that don't necessarily um, base themselves in the 12 steps. But because the 12 steps have been around a, lot, a long time and have proven to work for some people, you will find that some treatment programs embrace those as a structure. But ultimately, even the 12 steps offer you, um, it's a spiritual program. The 12 steps are a spiritual program, not a religious program. And they do open the uh, up to the term of higher power rather than like the biblical G-O-D that we, that we know and love. So while it is thought to be um, that the 12 steps are religious, uh, they are actually uh, spiritual. So yes, there are other options for people. It's just a matter of finding them and being straightforward that that's not what you're looking for, right? So if somebody said, that's not for me, what do you got? We would point them in that direction. So thank you, thanks for that question. Yeah, so the question was, um, how do you know when somebody has a problem and then how do you approach them um, if you feel like that's the next step? Um, I, I think, you know, it's really staying in a space of observation right, to note mood, you know, dramatic mood swings and dramatic behaviors and lethargy and motivation has shifted in a way that seemingly unlike the person that you knew before. Um, I think, you know, initially, uh, I don't think a, a conversation is uncalled for, right, just to say, hey, I have, I have concerns. You don't seem like yourself. Right? Not, you know, so there would be like the language shift rather than like, I think you have a problem with drugs. Right? Like that's not helpful. But to say, hey, I'm in a space of observation with you and I've noticed that you've been very erratic or I've noticed that you've just not been motivated and that you're not yourself and I wonder, you know, what might be going on with you? Right? I always try to lead with questions uh, to get the person talking a little bit. Um, and then to say, you know, how about we find some resources for you, right? How about we do some investigating? I can maybe help you find some resources. Um, because the, the, the stages of change, like there is this like pre-contemplation where that person might not even be in a space of thinking about getting help. That's a normal phase of change. And so just like I said when I came here, like I'm planting seeds like, what if your concerned conversation has just planted a seed and that person didn't think that, they didn't know that anyone could see what was going on. And you saying, I'm concerned, planted that seed so that eventually when they're ready, that will always stick with them. I just have a quick example of when I had acted out at a sibling's wedding and my brother did not hesitate to write me a letter and tell me, that I had a problem. And my reaction was like, you don't know me, right? You don't know what I'm going through. That has always remained with me. The fact that he was courageous enough to say, I see something that's not going right for you. 
Um, in the moment, was I like, Ooh. yeah, but it will, it will never leave me. Like, I, I'm honored that he did that. And so, yeah, you may, find, you may find some resistance, but the more compassion and empathy you can meet them with and concern, you may be surprised. Any other questions or concerns? Comments? That's great. I'll stick around. Okay, well, yeah, thank you so much. And I hope you have a wonderful week. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.